hello. OMG, as the kids say. You're probably wondering why the hell I'm in a uh, track. That's because I'm at McCarran Park uh, at the north end of Williamsburg. Oh, cutting it off from Greenpoint, which I've covered in a past video. But uh, today's video is about Williamsburg, Brooklyn. You may know it for its hipster coffee shops and artisanal cheeses and whatever, but uh, it's got a lot of history, really good history and a lot of stuff going on. So we're gonna cover all that. Before we start, Eric, how the hell are you? I'm doing good. Glad to hear it. Super excited to hear it, pumped to hear it. Before we start the video, guys, check out the Patreon. It's a huge help. That's a game changer, baby. It funds all these things. There's all kinds of levels, different tiers. Any bit helps. Some extras on there, <laughs> you know, mostly PG. Also, too, like the video, subscribe. That's a big help. Uh, if you watch more than one of these things, helps bump us in the analytics ahead of all the, you know, uh, squirrel, you know, jet skiing videos. I don't know. Uh, I don't know if that's a thing. But why don't we just go ahead and get started, Eric? We got a lot to cover, so I don't want to take up too much time in my intro. Don't want to be long-winded. All right, let's get out of here. Let's do it. <sighs> All right, so I don't need these anymore. Well, we're here at our first stop, and this is the Williamsburg Savings Bank on Broadway and Driggs. To talk to you a little bit about the history of Williamsburg, uh, one of the things you may notice is that the Williamsburg uh, has an H at the end of it. And uh, that's because it used to be spelled with an H. Anywho, the story goes, 1638, the Dutch buy a lot of land from the Lenape Native Americans who were here before. All right. Then, in 1661, Boswijk incorporates as a little, a little city, a little village here, uh, Bushwick, anglicizes Bushwick, right? Outside of Bushwick, in 1792, in this little area near what is today Williamsburg, a man named Richard Woodhull buys a ton of land with the intent of building like a little, you know, place for people to live and stuff like that. 1800, he names it Williamsburg after Jonathan Williams, a corporal who was his friend, I'm sorry, a colonel who was his friend, God forbid you get his rank wrong, who actually surveyed the land for him. Uh, it was actually kind of a failure uh, until uh, maybe like 10, 11 years later when uh, they built a highway to the interior of Brooklyn. It kind of connected a little more and people started moving here. Fast forward, 1827, it becomes a village. 1840, it becomes a town. By then, people had already started to settle here. A lot of the rich, uh, you know, capitalists uh, of uh, Manhattan or New York City started to build little places here. People like the Vanderbilt, etc. right? All right, 1840 becomes a town. 1852 becomes a city, the city of Williamsburg. It has already kind of blossomed into this thing. And then in 1855, it is basically pulled into Brooklyn. Now, Brooklyn had started out as a village just like Boswijk, except it had started swallowing up the villages around it. It was one of the six original villages of the Brooklyn side of the East River. There were six. Brooklyn was one of them. You had Boswijk, other ones to the south. But it's the one that kind of grew and swallowed up the other ones, creating the city of Brooklyn, uh, which you know, which is a whole nother thing, but it got, it got pulled in. Williamsburg got pulled in. But here you could see the Williamsburg Savings Bank, which was started in 1851 to cater to the growing city, huh? or to the growing town of uh, Brooklyn. And then uh, this was built here in 1875 by George Post, who actually was famous for uh, designing the New York, uh, New York Stock Exchange. Uh, this headquarters of the Williamsburg Savings Bank was then actually uh, replaced by the headquarters that was built in uh, downtown Brooklyn. You know that real tall building that looks like a, uh, a thing of uh, lipstick? Uh, let's say that, it looks like that. But that, uh, it's condos today, obviously, like just about everything. But uh, yeah, pretty cool. You know that building, right, Eric? The one down in downtown Brooklyn? The lipstick building, who doesn't? Yeah, the lipstick building, that's what we'll call it. Uh, looks like a thing of lipstick. Nah, it doesn't really look like lipstick. It looks like uh, a d <laughs> Sorry. All right, let's keep moving. Oh, don't mind me. I'm just sitting here casually on a stoop. So New York. I'm actually in Fillmore Place here between Roebling and Driggs, and it is one of the earliest, uh, I guess, single shot developments of housing here in Williamsburg that's still left today. Uh, it was developed by a guy named Alfred Clock, good old Al Clock. And, uh, and Ephraim Miller. And they bought up this land in the 1840s and they created uh, Fillmore Place, naming it after Millard Fillmore, one of the least popular presidents of all time, I guess. And, you know, I'm sure they went on to found an acting school called the John Wilkes Booth School of Acting, you know, along those lines. But uh, anyways, they developed this, becomes like a little housing area. Once again, mid-1800s, 
Uh, Williamsburg started to come into its own. It became a city in 1852, which I talked about. Um, and then industry came along as well. So it started to kind of pick up around this time. So they built things like this to entice people to come out of New York City to come over to this area. So kind of cool. Uh, you got your little Italian at row, row houses and whatnot. Um, but yeah, you can see it's more than just, uh, you know, uh, brunch spots and thrift stores. This is a pretty cool little area, right, Eric? It is, yeah, it's quiet. Yeah, it's very quiet. In fact, speaking of quiet, Henry Miller, the author, lived over here at 662 Driggs. Uh, Henry Miller made quite an uproar. He was the, actually the author of uh, Tropic of Cancer and Tropic of Capricorn, in case you didn't know that. And those books were banned to high hell while he was alive because they had a lot of uh, questionable situations back then in the book pages, meaning sex. A lot of people couldn't handle that back in the day, uh, you know. But uh, yeah. So it's a sex party neighborhood. Pretty much, sex party neighborhood. Uh, Henry Miller led sex parties. Um, it's a good thing uh, HBO wasn't around back then, you know. Uh, wait till they get a load of Game of Thrones, huh? Wow. Yeah, uh, it's a nice plug for a show that was on 10 years ago. But uh, yeah, I don't know, Eric. This is a cool little glimpse into old Williamsburg. Uh, as it continued to develop, more industry would come along and then, uh, you know, leave. And today it's a very fancy neighborhood. We're going to talk about all that as we go, as well as the immigrants that kind of populated Williamsburg. Are we ready to keep moving, Eric? Yes. Let's do it. So one of the things that Williamsburg is famous for is for the different immigrant groups that have made their home here. I'm standing in front of uh, Peter Luger, or Petey Lugi, as some people might call it. Uh, anyways, we'll start by a guy named uh, Peter Luger. Uh, his brother Carl Luger actually worked the, the, uh, the kitchen and stuff. It was actually like a billiards hall and bar, and eventually it was bought out by a guy who used to frequent it called Saul Foreman. And today, it's still run by descendants of the Foreman family. It's a really fancy steakhouse, Michelin star, all that stuff. So not the place to go if you're a vegetarian, but uh, pretty damn good. I bring it up to say that the Germans were a big immigrant group here. The Germans? The Germans? Right, Eric? Anyways, uh, this here is uh, Peter Luger. It's a great steakhouse, but it is indicative of the Germans who came here. Now, the Germans came initially, the big wave came here to New York in the mid-1800s. One of the reasons was because of a failed revolution in 1848. They were basically trying to change that whole principality system where all these different uh, principalities in that area of Europe were trying to come together into one country. You know, the, pe the heads of some of the biggest ones weren't having it, so they crushed that little revolution where they tried to create this little congress and all that. I'll save that for a different video. In fact, you can check out the Berlin video where I talk about that. There you go. Anyways, uh, Germans came here after that failed revolution, came and they settled. A lot of them settled in the East Village, which I've covered in that video. Come on, you gotta watch these videos, guys. They get tons of information. Anyways, some also settled here in Bushwick and in Williamsburg uh, because of the breweries and different lines of work. In fact, Charles Pfizer was a German immigrant. He started the, the company Pfizer in 1849. He paired up with this guy who was a confectioner. Uh, he was the chemist, and they created palatable drugs for people who didn't like taking, you know, drugs. You know, the popular medicines of the day for, like, intestinal worms. Yeah. That's a train. Not, not people who like worms. Yeah, big intestinal worms fans. Anyways, Pfizer started here pretty crazy. And then they started uh, get, getting, they gave, uh, or they provided the Union Army with, uh, with, with like, you know, medicines. And during the World Wars as well, it got really big. And also got really huge in 1998 when they gave Bob Dole his boners back. I don't know if you guys remember that. Good old Viagra. Yeah, I'm Bob Dole. I approve this message. That was a pretty good impersonation, right, Eric? Who's Bob Dole? I'm Bob Dole. You don't know who Bob Dole is? Oh my gosh, he's a, a senator back in the day. Anyways, the Germans came here mid 1800s, all the way to late 1800s. They were one of the first big uh, immigrant groups that came here to uh, Williamsburg. So you have some of the little bit uh, of their legacy here with Peter Luger. Uh, anyways, we're gonna talk about some of the more immigrant groups. Let's keep moving, right, Eric? Let's go. Let's go. All right. So now I'm at the part of the day where I have to turn my hat around. It's not. You know, not because I'm trying to look like a, a narc or something. I, it's the sun, all right? So, you kids smoke doobies, huh? You know where I can get some doobies? Anyways, uh, we're, at the, uh, we're at the base of the Williamsburg Bridge. This is very important. So, one of the things that helped Williamsburg grow 
uh, was the ferry service that started here at Broadway in 1865. That's one of the reasons why this little area uh, on Broadway, the little commercial area, developed with places like, you know, eventually, yeah, that's right, with places like Peter Luger, with all the different factory and cast iron buildings for industry. But what really exploded Brooklyn, Williamsburg, Brooklyn specifically, was this bridge, which was finished in 1903. This is the Williamsburg Bridge. Um, this was actually built by a guy named Henry Hornbostel. It's kind of a funny name. That's kind of if my name was uh, Tommy Horn Delgado. Uh, yeah, sorry. Anyways, it was a very beautiful bridge, big, big bridge. Actually, it was the biggest suspension bridge in the world after, uh, you know, and, and overtook the Brooklyn Bridge in 1903. You can hear the trains going over it. Uh, those are the JMZ trains. But uh, this is what kind of exploded the uh, population here. In fact, the population here in uh, Williamsburg doubled very, very quickly after. Now, to give you an idea, Brooklyn exploded initially because of the Brooklyn Bridge, which opened in 1883. The population was around 580,000 at the time. 15 years later, when Brooklyn consolidated with the rest of New York City in 1898, it was already at almost a million. Uh, then this area was exploded by the Williamsburg Bridge, specifically the Jewish population, which settled in South Williamsburg. Now, in case you don't know, over 10% of New York is Jewish. At In the 1950s, almost a quarter of New York was Jewish. Uh, and a lot of these Jews came over from uh, Eastern Europe, the Russian Empire area. Uh, starting in 1881 after the assassination of Tsar Alexander II, uh, who, you know, was kind of popular, I guess, but very autocratic. He ended serfdom, so people liked him for that, but he was uh, still autocratic, so he was assassinated. They blamed the, you know, the Jews partly, so people started pogroms, which were basically just destroying their towns and villages, a lot of intimidation and terror, so a lot of Jews came over here and settled here in New York. The Orthodox community is still located here in South Williamsburg today. Uh, a lot of uh, Hasidic Jews uh, make their home down there. Uh, so that's kind of interesting. Uh, I don't know if you guys know, the Tsar system was actually what was in place before the Russian Revolution in 1917. Uh, they were known for being autocratic and very like, you know, they, they hoarded wealth and all that stuff. Which, not, not for nothing, but I remember going to like a, uh, an exhibit, a museum exhibit called the Treasures of the, uh, Treasures of the, uh, the Tsar in the 1990s and it was like, you know, like Fabergé eggs and things. And it was kind of supposed to show you why, why people revolted. And I was thinking to myself, I was like, well, Jeff Bezos has like a $500 million yacht. That beats the hell out of a Fabergé egg. Maybe we're kind of sitting, sitting still here in the United States, just kind of taking it on the chin. Is that, is that bad, Eric? Uh, all of it's bad. It's all bad, right? Anyways, this is, uh, this is here. This is the, the Williamsburg Bridge, 1903. Pretty cool building uh, structure. In fact, in 1909, because Brooklyn was growing even more, they then built the uh, Manhattan Bridge down next to the Brooklyn Bridge. Pretty cool. Uh, but yeah, very Jewish area here in, uh, in uh, Williamsburg. And another group that actually came because of the bridge, partly because of the bridge, was the Italians, who settled a little bit more in the north of Williamsburg. Uh, in fact, the Feast of the Giglio just passed, uh, uh, Mount Carmel, over in uh, north Brooklyn, uh, north uh, Williamsburg. Happens every summer. It's been happening since 1903. So they set a little enclave over there. Pretty cool. Uh, I covered the Feast of the Giglio in a very early video back in the day when I was just a young, a young buck. Uh, you can check that one out. Yeah, I gotta plug those. But uh, yeah, pretty cool. One of the things that kind of helped this area explode here in the early 1900s. In fact, by 1917, it was one of the densely, most densely populated uh, places in the entire country here in uh, Williamsburg. Pretty cool. All right, Eric, what do you think? Should we keep moving? Get out of the sun. Let's get out of the sun. We are roasting, baby. Holy Lord. All right. Okay, so I'm now here at South Third. I'm here at what's called Los Sures. That's right, nice little accent there. But uh, this is kind of where, you know, the Puerto Rican population uh, of Williamsburg, which is the last major uh, immigrant wave that kind of came into uh, Williamsburg, kind of makes their home here and uh, south of the bridge a little bit, down into what is also the Jewish neighborhood. Uh, but it's all here, it's called Los Sures because the south, you know, the south part, sur is south. Anyways, uh, now the Puerto Rican population, there's two waves of the Puerto Rican population uh, coming here to New York City. Uh, the first came around the 1920s in that area uh, because actually in 1917 uh, you had the citizenship granted, the Jones Act granted citizenship to the Puerto Ricans. Uh, by the way, going back a little bit uh, is when, you know, 18, war of, uh, in 1898 you had the Spanish-American War. I don't know if you know anything about that. It's where, uh, you know, the USS Maine blew up in, uh, mysteriously. Uh, outside of Cuba and uh, you know a lot of the media 
and politicians kind of pushed this narrative of uh, the Spanish being behind it. They kind of sold this entire war based on kind of fabrications, uh, which doesn't sound familiar at all, does it? Also, surprise knowledge drop there. Yeah, pretty good, right? Anyways, the, the, uh, the Spanish-American War, when the United States beat the pants off of uh, a weakened Spain, they got uh, Puerto Rico, in addition to, you know, control of Cuba, the Philippines. Anyways, that's extra. Uh, anyways, you know, Puerto Rico stays a kind of a colony. Uh, and when the Jones Act was passed and given citizenship to the, uh, to the uh, people who lived in Puerto Rico, a lot of them came over here. But it wasn't really until after Commonwealth status was granted in 1952 that a huge wave came looking for manufacturing jobs. Oh, that's great. Well, the problem with that was after World War II, uh, Manufacturing jobs were kind of leaving the city, unfortunately, so kind of just missed each other there. So a lot of the Puerto Ricans who came here looking for those jobs uh, didn't find them. So unfortunately, a lot of them were, were, you know, kind of like condemned to poverty a little bit. Anyways, a lot of them settled in uh, Alphabet City, <laughs> Lower East Side. Can we please stop shooting in truck depots? That's unbelievable. How I mean, you didn't have to honk like that. Anyways, a lot of them settled Lower East Side, a lot of them settled in Alphabet City, both videos of which I covered. Holy crap, if this is your first time watching one of my videos, you got a lot of catching up to do. A lot of them also settled here. So uh, this area kind of became a little bit of a Puerto Rican neighborhood. Uh, now, today I was telling you the neighborhood's changing a lot. We're gonna cover this a little bit more later on, but a lot of the people here are you know, being displaced, having trouble affording the rents, uh, et cetera, after decades and decades of steady uh, prices. They are now starting to go through the roof. Uh, but we'll talk about that a little later. Uh, but it's pretty cool, you got a, Puerto Rico, hombre, oh, me gusta escuchar a Bad Bunny, huh? Oh. Are you doing good, fellas, here? No, that, was my, uh, that was my Puerto Rican accent impersonation. Wow. Yeah, no big deal. I speak Spanish. I speak a little Spanish. But uh, yeah, anyways, this is a really cool little mural here on the public school on South Third. Uh, you also have here a lot of things named and streets named to kind of honor the Puerto Rican population. You have Borinquen Place, which, uh, by the way, Boricua, you know, that actually is, it derives from the Taino word for the island of Puerto Rico, which uh, the Taino were the Native Americans who lived there before the Spanish colonized it. Anyways, I'm getting ahead of myself. You can watch the video I did on Puerto Rico for that one. I did a video on Puerto Rico. How about that? <sighs> Sorry, I'm getting carried away, Eric. This is really getting getting to be too much. Uh, but yeah, Puerto Rican population. Uh, we, we, we talked about the Jews, we talked about the Germans in Puerto Rico, and the Puerto Ricans are also a big representation of the immigrant history here, the rich immigrant history here uh, in Williamsburg. Also, too, right around the corner, a little bit away from here, is where you have Hakeem's apartment from Coming to America. There's a little trivia for you. <laughs> uh, all right, I don't know, that might be too deep deep of a cut for some of you young young kids. Is that a Bob Dole movie? I'm Bob Dole. Bob Dole. Pretty good impersonation, right? Yeah, pretty good. I'm Bob Dole. I'm running for president against Bill Clinton, Bob Dole. Hey, Tom, uh, why don't we go to the next spot? Yeah, let's go to the next spot. All right, so I'm here at the corner of North 11th and Wythe uh, to talk to you guys about the industrial history of uh, Williamsburg. Uh, yeah, I'm back in the uh, narc mode. Uh, you kids know where I can score some marijuana? Anyways, uh, this here is the Wythe Hotel, actually in 1901. It was actually a barrel factory back in the day, and then it became a textile factory. Today, it's a fancy little hotel. From 2012, it's been a, a hotel. They actually repurposed some some actual industrial signs there for the letters, kind of cool. Got a good view of the city. So you see how they repurpose the industrial buildings? Huh? It's gonna be a running theme here. We're gonna talk about that a little more later. You also have here to the right, you have Brewer's Row. You also have the Brooklyn Brewery. The Brooklyn Brewery was an old matzo factory that became a brewery when a guy named uh, Steve Hendy opened uh, the brewery here. He was actually a, a Middle Eastern correspondent, photographer, and he said he saw some crap over there where he was like, yeah, I don't wanna do this anymore. And he, he, he kind of like, Fulfill the dream of starting a brewery. Today, it's a very popular beer, Brooklyn uh, Brewery Beer. Uh, actually, I think Kieran owns a part of the, the, the company now, uh, but it used to be a monster factory. Another part, and then right next to it is the old Hecla Ironworks, which in 1876 was an iron kind of like uh, uh, art and, and casting area. And they were actually famous for casting the, uh, the IRT subway kiosks when they opened the IRT in 1904. They had these kiosks over all the different entrances. And uh, so for example, there's one, a replica of one in uh, Astor Place, which I covered my East Village video. 
hell. Uh, but yeah, so you could see that all over the city, but or used to be able to see it over the city, but they did them there. And today, Heckle Iron Works is Brooklyn Bowl, uh, which is like a venue since 2009, like a bowling venue, and you can hear music there. Like they've had people like Snoop Dogg and all that stuff play concerts there. Uh, great date spot back in the day, I'll tell you that. You know, it's a good place to go and you know hear some music. You know, do a little bowling. You like to bowl, Eric? Uh, no. I think the key to a good bowling date is you got to have a good uh, a good dance lined up, celebratory dance whenever you get a good uh, roll. I remember yeah? that. Yeah, remember that. I think mine would be like this. It'd be like this. You know? It's a good it's a good dance right there. Maybe you'll be able to use that someday. Yeah, maybe one day. Anyways, uh, yeah, Wyeth Hotel, Brooklyn Bowl, Brooklyn Brewery, all this to kind of show you that it was a big industrial area here. Uh, you had the Domino Sugar Factory, you had uh, D. Appleton, which was actually a publisher. Uh, they published Origin of Species, uh, they published uh, uh, Alice in Wonderland, really important publisher. You had uh, Pfizer, uh, which we talked about, but you still have some of the remnants of it, but today they've been repurposed to be date spots, fancy hotels, breweries. Funny how that happens, huh, Eric? Also, too, interesting fact about the Wyeth Hotel, Eric, the filmmaker extraordinaire, had his film premiere there. What year was that, Eric? 2018. Disposition. We'll Disposition, out. guys. There's a there's an Eric plug right there. Eric plugging first his stuff away. First time that was his first time here in the city when he when he debuted his film there. So you know what? We got some pros working here for you guys, huh? You guys have some pros making your your content. How's that for content? All right. Well, anyways, they have a they have a huge bust of Eric inside. Once you walk in, an eight foot bust of his face. The basement of the hotel. The whole basement of the hotel is is a bust of his face. Time uh, to go, Tom. All right, it's time to go. All right, let's, let's do it. Next, next spot. All right, so I'm now here at Domino Park, here next to the Williamsburg Bridge again. But uh, here to talk to you about how Williamsburg has kind of developed today. Now, what's interesting is you have a lot of some of the uh, old industry buildings. So just to give you a little background, the Domino Sugar Factory dates back here at what used to be the Havemeyer Elder Sugar Factory dates back to the 1850s. The oldest buildings and structures here today date back to the 1880s. There was actually a sugar refinery and factory here until 2004. It was a big deal. Uh, in fact, just to give you an idea how big a deal, this was actually part of the American uh, Sugar Trust, which in the uh, late 1800s was one of the first 12 companies on the Dow Jones Index, Industrial Index. Ah, isn't that cool? Here's another fact for you. This is actually too the Domino Sugar Company was responsible for inventing the sugar packet. Huh? That's a good fact, Eric, right? Um, anyways, this is now the Domino Park. Now, I bring this up to say that a lot of the former uh, industrial land and, and structures have been turned to either residential or commercial. Uh, what happened in Williamsburg uh, was basically you had more artists and young people and stuff coming in in the 1990s, which culminated in a huge rezoning in 2005. So in 2005, Mayor Bloomberg rezoned 184 blocks of Williamsburg and Greenpoint just to the north, meaning he took this land that was industrial, uh, it was, uh, you know, it was smaller, whatever, smaller scale, and he rezoned it to high density residential, some parkland, etc. But what ended up happening is you had these massive developments all along the Williamsburg waterfront being developed. And because New York City was on the rise and this neighborhood was on the rise, it quickly became luxury housing. So today, this area is extremely expensive to live in, and you have things like this park being developed by this man named David Walentis and his company, Two Trees Management, which uh, is responsible for building up Dumbo, and they're building up this parkland to increase the value of the residential and commercial buildings around it. Um, this is kind of controversial. There's been back and forth. Some people say it's been good for the neighborhood, others say it's bad because uh, it has displaced some people. It's made the, one thing that you can't argue, it's made the neighborhood is extremely expensive today. So regardless of what you think, it is expensive and it's prohibitively expensive for a lot of people, including the people who were here before. However, it is cleaner, it is safer. So there is a discussion to be had. What does need to be understood is that these are city policies that come into play. Things like rezoning, 
uh, dictate what happens in neighborhoods like this. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. Also, there are policies that could be put in place and that are blocked by a lot of the, by a lot of the same people who develop things like this. There are policies that could be put in place to protect small businesses, to increase the amount of affordable housing, to redefine what affordable housing is, making it more affordable, et cetera, et cetera. So the point being, you know, look up your city council person. Huh? How about that? Eric, do you know who your city council person is? No idea. <sighs> Shame. 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 You haven't registered? No. Oh, good I'm Lord. California. Good Lord. Don't be like Eric, everybody. That's my new motto. Got to oh. register. <laughs> I know that was a little harsh. Sorry. Uh, be like Eric and everything except for his registering. I don't have a driver's license. Learn to drive as well, if you can. Uh, do everything you can, can do, you know, live life, YOLO. What's also interesting too is that this used to, like I said, this used to all be industrial, right? What's hard to imagine is that the waterfront back in the day, in the late 1800s, around that time, was not a place you wanted to be. Rich people, et cetera, didn't want to live on the waterfront because the waterfront was where industry made its home. So this is where all the offshoot went into the river. This is where all the smokestacks were. And they needed to be here because the boats pulled into the piers and took all the crap away. Ah, look at that. Uh, also, this is a kind of interesting story. I don't know if I ever told you this, Eric, but I was doing a tour of, uh, I was doing a tour of Dumbo one time with like, this is back in the day, with like a tour of like 20 people. And I was talking about all this like, you know, gentrification stuff. And uh, there was like this old man, like kind of like wandering around the, the group that I was talking to, like with a newspaper in his arm, like shabbily dressed, like listening. And, uh, and anyways, at the end of like my little spiel, he comes in and he goes, hey, just, uh, just be clear, change can be good, right? And I go, well, I don't know, it depends on who you ask. He goes, all right. And then he puts his hand on, he goes, I'm David Walentis. And he goes, I own the neighborhood. See, what's funny is that this billionaire is just hovering around listening to what some dip <laughs> tour guide is saying about him. I guess ego knows no bounds, baby. Uh, but from that, we'll keep moving. What do you think, Eric? Let's, get Let's wrap this thing up pretty soon, huh? All right, well, we're here in the Marsha P. Johnson uh, State Park, which, by the way, is the first state park in New York named after a trans woman. Pretty cool. I actually talked about this in my uh, uh, New York Pride video. There you go. There's your last plug for the day. Anyways, uh, we had ourselves a little time, huh, Eric? We walked went through a lot of stuff, talked about the different immigrant waves in Williamsburg, industrial, how it's being developed today, its early beginnings as a town, as a village. Oh, covered so much per use as the kids say but we're here on the east river we're gonna wrap it up here it's very windy over here Tom. it is a little windy you yeah. like a second beard of hair going on second beard of hair you know it's all for the uh it gives a good uh it's very good uh, ambiance makes it look like you know very mysterious wow. very mysterious uh, but anyways that being said guys uh if you like the video go ahead and uh you know please like it subscribe but more importantly check out the patreon in all in all seriousness check out the patreon <laughs> Uh, there's some extras on there, you know, um, any little bit helps, different tiers, all that stuff. And that's what really helps move these things forward. Uh, so I'd really appreciate it. Otherwise, guys, we kind of made it to the end. Eric, how would you, how'd you feel about that one? That was pretty fun. It was a nice yeah, day. Yeah, uh, Williamsburg a cool place. Cool place, you know, it was a nice... Lots of tea just walking around. Yeah, and it was warm, a nice day, not too hot. You know, it was a little warm, but, uh, you know, now we got the beach here i guess i wouldn't dare go, go into this water ever you couldn't pay me enough but uh it's still nice to take a look and see this is it it's very sad very sad always sad to say goodbye it's and the hardest thankfully there's a hundred thousand other videos we've shot yes thankfully there's a lot more you can check out uh, and also guys thank you for watching i appreciate it and i'm gonna go so uh ttyl <laughs> you know as the kids say all right and uh Remember, Bob Dole. Bob Dole endorses this video. Bob Dole. No. I'm Bob Dole. No. All right, I'm out of here. See y'all later. Take.